The number two bus runs from the Kotel to the other places in Yerushalayim. And when they trace the steps of the suicide bomber, they figured that he got on at the Kotel. They also put the time when he got on the Kotel. The time he got on the Kotel was the time in which, at the time, it was probably about 150 NCSY Kolo boys were making their way to security to go to Marif. It means we walked past the bus bomber. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Ian Podcast. So today, I had the absolute zechus to sit down with Rabbi Moshe Benevitz. Rabbi Benevitz is actually the managing director of NCSY. He's also a Rebbe at Yeshiva Reshit, and he is also the head of NCSY Kol. He has a lot of things that he's done over his years, and we really got to get Ian today on his story. Um, we talked a lot about NCSY Kolal, a lot about how he essentially became who he is today, and touched on some very interesting topics. So... I hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And without further ado, it's time for the episode with Rabbi Moshe Benevitz. Welcome to the Israel Gap Year Be'in Podcast. I'm your host, Avi Proctor, and in each episode, we get Be'in in depth into the remarkable lives of individuals in Israel who dedicate themselves to inspiring the next generation of Kalah Israel. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for, uh, for coming and, and being a part of this. Here. So before I start with anything, I always like to start with a little bit of Hakar Satov, um, sp- specifically to you in this situation. Um, we've worked together with NCSY a little bit, and we've had different interactions over the course of the years. And just from my speeches in Shraga that I heard from you to our interaction this past summer, I, I've learned a tremendous amount from you. And even seeing how you handle yourself through different people and even on the court when we play ball on the weekends, um, it's, it's something that I really admire about you. And just I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to come and, and Spend with me over here. It's very uh, kind of you to say. Chazal already tell us that it's a, it's a two-way street. When you have any sort of meaningful relationship and you exchange meaningful ideas, I would definitely include, and maybe we'll get into it later, on the court and the rest. There's, there's meant to be a degree of reciprocity. So thank you for saying it, and I certainly feel the same way right back to you. So this is a great project, a great endeavor, and all the things we've been privileged to be involved with together, including Friday Morning Ball, have been <laughs> fruitful and productive and meaningful experiences for me as well. Amazing. So I'm sitting here with you right now after years of experience in your life through many different avenues and, and different initiatives and projects and, and, and jobs that you've had. And I'm very curious, how did you get to who you are today? And then we'll, we'll kind of go on a lot of different topics, but just take me through the beginning years of your life and, and kind of what you went through in order to, to become the national or international director of NCSY. I'm the managing director the of managing NCSY. Director. Uh, <laughs> other people serve in the, in the title as international director, Robert Micha Greenland. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I've been involved with NCSY for quite a while. I was involved with NCSY already when I was in high school, and it was my first uh, official paying job also, and took on different degrees of responsibility, most well-known probably with NCSY Colel, but a number of other areas as well, and uh, that's been, like I said, well over 30 years that I've been involved with the organization. Look, I, I, I was privileged to grow up in a really wonderful community and an even more wonderful home. I was not a person who grew up without access or an appreciation for how great uh, our religion can be, our lives can be. I was a very happy child, and I grew up with an enormous amount of optimism that was born out of seeing how well things can work and how well things could develop. I grew up in Teaneck. Teaneck that I grew up in is not the Teaneck of today, and that's a big part of my story, meaning it was people who took a chrayas to help build something, and I am sure, although I probably didn't know it at the time, that that had a transformative effect on my life, seeing how in a place, I wouldn't call it the wilderness, but we didn't have you know, more than one pizza store, maybe a bagel store. There weren't 100 restaurants. There weren't thousands and thousands of Jews that were there. There were a couple of shuls and not much else that was going on. Uh, Every teenager in Teaneck when I was growing up knew every other teenager in Teaneck. Uh, We were all friends. We all got together in the same places and did the same things. And our parents, almost without exception, were involved in building something that became the major center of Torah that it is today. And it requires a degree of optimism and love to be able to do that. And among the many things that I got from my parents, from my family, and from the greater community of Teaneck, it was, it was definitely that. Uh, and I, uh, I, I love that always. I love the notion of building, and I especially love the notion of there being this almost utopian potential. You mentioned that we're sitting here now 
30 years, but where we're sitting matters a lot in all of the things that we're going to speak about and certainly in our story. Uh, being part of a relatively new Ramat Beit Shemesh community and a fundamentally significant act of building the land of Israel, it's based on, even in the challenging times that we find ourselves in right now, it's based on the same degree of optimism, love, and, and confidence. Uh, and I, I got that from my parents. My parents could be critical people. My parents didn't think that everything in the world was wonderful, but they believed fundamentally from their own life experiences that this is worth sacrificing for, working on, and trying to, to create together. Uh, and uh, it's been a privilege to be able to have a, a role or play any small part in that over the years. So growing up in America, and as you say, growing up at Teaneck, did you ever envision yourself doing what you are doing today? Um, did you ever envision even living in Eretz Yisrael, Bichlal? It's a great, great question. Um, it, it, I think there are two levels to that kind of did you ever envision. On a practical level, the answer is is not that much at all. Uh, meaning on a practical level, um, it was not uh, it was not every day like, you know, count the minutes till we get to Israel. Uh, I grew up in a particular kind of Zionistic environment in which the type of, of utopias that I'm describing were always in Israel in a place like that. Uh, there was a real heartfelt sense of that. But practically, it might have well been on Mars, meaning it wasn't really a, a part or, or counting the minutes, you know, down to it or anything else like that. I don't recall a single inspirational charge, you've got to go to Israel, in my upbringing, certainly until I got to Yeshiva post high school. Um, I, don't, I don't recall ever hearing you know, anything like that. Similarly, I don't think there was ever a discussion or a serious thought. I did not grow up, I was, when I was eight years old, I didn't think I was gonna be a Rebbe. When I was in Yeshiva and I came to Yeshiva University, I wasn't sure that I was gonna be a Rebbe. I was interested in a number of other things, psychology, um, and especially um, experimental research psychology was extremely exciting to me. I had a couple of great teachers in that area and, and took some time you know, working, a couple of internships even. When I was dating my wife, I remember, at, by the time we were engaged, and we didn't date for all that long, by the time I was engaged, it was much more clear to me that I was going to be going into teaching. But even, like I said, three years into YU, um, and at the beginning there, I did not, I was not given that I was going to be going into teaching. I think when we, on our first date, it was, it's either going to be this or either going to be that. But the fundamental things that draw me both to the land of Israel and to teaching were always there. I mean, from a very, very young age, for as long as I can remember, those were the things that were exciting to me, that uh, I was going to find a way to tap into one way or the other. So in, in kind of the, the, the path to getting to become one of the tops of, of NCSY, um, I, I think something that, that could be very beneficial for people to, to understand is that things take time and to, to develop, I guess, and to grow in terms of the ladder of, of getting to, to a higher um, place in a specific organization like NCSY. So for you, when you said, you know, you went to YU, and of course you were involved with NCSY when you were in high school, take me through the, I guess, the ladder to essentially starting off with NCSY to growing and getting to where you are right now. It's also a great question. I, I think there are two things that are critically important that that allow for that trajectory to happen. The first is is just to care. Meaning if you care about the same things all the time, then in its right time, you will find the right expression to have a passion in those areas. People underestimate their capacity to accomplish, to do, to achieve virtually anything. If that's where they want to put their focus and put their energies, put their cojos, uh, that's the way you advance, like I said, in almost anything. We have these people in, in celebrity industries, whether it's sports or Hollywood, and the rest of you are like, how did that guy get that? job. Well, the number one ingredient I can guarantee you, much more than being a, a Nepo kid or having an opportunity because your dad gave it to you or anything else like that, much more common is the fact that this person was obsessed with this. This person genuinely cared about that industry in that area. They hung out, they were experts, they spent a lot of time, and they, they did those types of things that are the types of things that excellence is built on. So the number one thing is you have to care a lot and you have to care at the right time, which brings me to the second point, which is that it, it has to be very, very sequential. You can't skip any steps. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that if you are interested in accomplishing something on a big scale, you better start accomplishing on a small scale. You better be the air in your area and in your place. There's a very, very gradual progression of excellence. That's really the way it works. I do think it's the same thing in sports, by the way. I'm always suspect. A lot of people are. You have, uh, you know, they're evaluating talent for the upcoming NFL draft. And one of the things that a lot, and it, it doesn't always work like that, but you wonder, how did a person who did not dominate in college, how's he going to 
going to start dominating in the NFL or in the NBA. And, and it, it is a suspect thing. You want the person who was the best eighth grader and the best ninth grader and then the best and then and then and then and then and then it progresses that way and they're able to build and not all of them do. You could be the best eighth grader and peak out there, but it's much more common for you to go from the best eighth grader to the best freshman in college to the best rookie in the NBA to the Hall of Fame than it is to say I actually was never the best anything and then I was a quote unquote late bloomer. It's more likely that that happens in sports than it happens in Chinuch. I know almost no late bloomers in the world of Chinuch. There are people who when they were in 10th grade you never would have imagined that they would become a Chanuch and people have different life trajectories. But a person gets involved in Chinuch and they're highly mediocre and then 15 years later they're accomplishing world changing things. World changing things happen. We, we, we believe very strongly. The Gemara talks about this also. Call him a Kayim Nefesh Achas. We believe that every person is an entire world. There are all sorts of metaphysical implications of that but there's very practical career implications to that. We talk about this in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur Aseris Yom Tshuva. Start by changing yourself then you could change the entire world. Start by changing a student a classroom. Start by impacting one place and then see if that can be scaled and replicated in an entire world. If you say I'm wasting my time in a classroom I'm waiting for the day in which I get to change the entire world I can nearly guarantee you that you will not see payrolls from those efforts. It doesn't work like that. Do, do what you do and do it in the place that you do. The world will notice. We don't have a glut of talented people who are trying to be mashpia on the next generation and trying to be excellent at chinuch. Be a great parent. Work on your, your place first. Uh, and that's the, that's the number one thing to do. I, I also think there's another part that relates to what I just said. That's part of my own, you know, kind of personal trajectory. Uh, Rav Moshe famously writes in a tshuva that the same way that we have miser in our money, we have miser in our time. I think there's another analogy that we can make from the world of tzedakah to the world of chinuch and the world of impact. And that is in tzedakah, there's a concept of aniye ircha kodem. And I think that part of this principle of start with your own kind of circle, your own daladamos, be mashpia on your friends, on your classroom, on your community, on your family, and then see how that branches out and how the world discovers you. I, I think that that's also, like I said, it's certainly part of my story. I don't think I would have gotten involved in NCSY any place other than Teaneck, New Jersey. It was, it was Teaneck, New Jersey. It was guys from MTA. It was the people that I knew. I felt that there is a, a halachic achrayist. The people that you know the best, the people that you interact with the best. Let's see how you do with them. And then see how you can scale that out to building and creating something that has a greater effect on the greater world. Wow. Okay. So in terms of when you came to Eretz Yisrael, I, I want to touch on um, how you got involved in, in teaching in Reishit, because um, that's another aspect of Chinuch, um, aside from NCSY. So when you were coming here to Eretz Yisrael, did you have a plan of, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on NCSY here. I know you travel a lot back to America, and I want to touch on that in a second. But when you came here, was it like, oh, I had a path in terms of specifically the Chinuch. I had a job lined up. What was that process like for you? There are a lot of parts to that question, uh, and you can come back to any of them that you want. But uh, basically, um, I definitely did have a plan. The plan was to try to help build and be mashpia um, simultaneously within my Dalit Amos, like I just said, to have a classroom and to have people that I interacted with on a tense way on a regular basis. I've never been disdainful of the classroom for the reasons that I just described before. I mean, the classroom has always been the top of the pyramid, not the bottom of the pyramid. It's not a launch, uh, you know, the, the, you, you have people, and again, I, I don't have that many um, high profile engagements. I don't, I don't go to the White House all that often or anything else like that. But there are people who are involved in chinuch or in klal work um, and, and they view that as being the top of the pyramid. You're like on the backs of your students in your little classroom, once upon a time I was an eighth grade Rebbe and now I'm, uh, you know, now I'm meeting presidents and heads of states. It's the opposite. It's, it's, it's an inverted process. Every interaction within those classrooms are the top of the pyramid and everything else you do in your life is an opportunity to have credibility and, and good stories and you know, just kind of have, have the influence that's required to connect to somebody, a single person in a single way. So uh, my plan was to be able to have that, that dual focus. What can I do on a local level, local meaning not just Ramah Pechemesh local, but but that, that singular classroom and to be able to have those types of chinuch experiences and to progress with that in a meaningful way. And what's the type of platforms that can allow me to have the type of hashpa that perhaps the Ribbon Shalom is demanding of me to have on our broader community and on the broader world. 
Uh, and I, I was lucky enough that I had both sustained employment with an NCSY that allowed me to look at some of the global opportunities in a serious and realistic way. And I was able to find, uh, I think there were many yeshivas in Israel that would have fit this bill. Uh, Rashid, I can describe in a minute about why that's the place that I ended up and have been happily teaching for the past 21 years. But it was, it was a great way for me to continue in the types of classrooms that I was familiar with and that I knew. That, that's the business that I knew. While there are definitely differences between an 11th grader and DRS or MTA or even Breweria, the three places that I taught in America in high school, there are definitely differences between that and uh, Shana Aleph and Reshit, just like there are differences between MTA and DRS and certainly Breweria. But the, fundamentally, it's a very similar type of avoda, and it was a very easy transition for me. Reshit uh, was very, very convenient geographically, although that was not the main reason. I go back quite a ways with all three of the Marcus sons that are involved in the yeshiva right now. Rechaim Marcus in Springfield is also involved uh, a little bit as well. Uh, but Ravelli was a chavrusa of mine, and uh, when we were chavrusas in Morsha Kolel, Ravdani is actually the one who's my age. Ravelli and I were chavrusas though in Morsha Kolel, and when we were not learning during our Chavrusa, which was probably more than either one of us would care to admit, he, he would outline. He would literally sketch out on a napkin like, I think someday we're going to open. I didn't know someday was going to be like in seven months, but I think someday we're going to open this yeshiva. And, and what he described was very, very beautiful and meaningful to me. And walking into Rashid, I had visited a couple of times when I was still teaching in America before we made Aliyah, but walking in like that first day of school and seeing come to fruition, the things that he had described, was and continues to be very, very meaningful to me. I've always felt very much at home there. And Ezehu Chacham Aroa Esanolat. You get a certain degree of insight when you see the way it was it was formed conceptually. So that's my Rashid story a little bit. So reverting back a little bit to the NCSY topic um, of having the job that you have right now, I know you do a lot of traveling. So could you touch on that a little bit and, and how you balance of a job at Rashid, raising six children at home, Six, right? Yeah. But it, it, yeah, I'm hesitating not because I don't remember, but because an important part of that, I mean, I don't want to cut you off. You can finish the it's question. A, it's okay. going to go there. <laughs> yeah. No, the reason why I hesitate one of the six is because I, I wouldn't do it if I had six children at home. Uh, three children are Baruch Hashem married and out of the house. Uh, a fourth of, of the of the six original, I said six could also be nine. Uh, nine could also be uh, 13, because that's the number of in-laws and now grandchildren, you know, that are part of the family. But I have a different level of a cry is to the children-in-law and the grandchildren and to the children who are out of the house anymore, not officially dependents. One of the children at home is not really at home, you know, fully like that anymore. Um, so it was a more opportune time. I have not since, we made Aliyah 21 years ago, like I said before, I did not travel nearly as extensively. I was on a regular Yeshiva Rebbe's kind of recruitment schedule and connected that with the things I had to do with NCSY for the vast majority of those 21 years. For about 13, 14 of those 21 years, I was traveling on a, on a normal schedule, three, four times a year. If there was a simcha, maybe five times a year, but not, and that would be with the family, you know, something like that. It wasn't, it wasn't as extensive as it now. Uh, when the majority of children, most of the children were out of the house and there was a little bit more of a formula and we, my wife and I knew ways that I could compensate for the times that I was away, I uh, was able to do that in a different way. It's a big question that comes up a lot of times in a lot of professions. If a person has an option of making aliyah, but it will require them to be an absentee parent, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Now, there's a friend of mine who years ago, uh, he's a social worker, he wrote an article in one of the local papers in which he just outlined uh, all of the dangers that are involved in that. Uh, he was not popular in the neighborhood because so many of his chaverim, neighbors, friends, people that he daven with were doing exactly that. And they were kind of being called out like you need to think twice and I'm a social worker working with your kids and and I, I see what happens. Half I, I can meet with a person, I can meet with a teen for you know three sessions, four sessions, and then I could tell him exactly what his father does for a living and how many times he's away from the house. And it's a real, real nisayon. Uh, again, he, he only pointed out the obvious and he paid a, an enormous price for doing it. I don't want to give any more details about that, but it was it was traumatic for the community a little bit. In the old days when people used to love to beat up on Ramat Beit Shemesh before it established itself as the incredible community that it is, there were so many criticisms of people levied against Ramat Beit Shemesh. We weren't Israeli enough and, you know, we tried to do too much in between the world of Haredi and the world of Dati Lumi. All these, all these things about why Ramat Beit Shemesh is going to be the next in the line of experimental communities that failed. Well, you see the cranes all around us. You see the property prices. You you see the quality of life over here. It is most certainly not failed uh, as a community. Obviously, there are people, there are always going to be people who struggle here and struggle there. One of the criticisms they levied was that you have an entire community that is predicated on a model of 
of commuting. I would never want to be the patron saint of those people. Like, look how it could be done. And to that point, I would never have done it again at the age, certain age, uh, you know, that my children were and the numbers that they were at. In terms of juggling it in Rashid, so when the travel started as much as it did, um, I would not have been able to start with that in Rashid. It was only when I had a certain degree of established credibility with the students and with the Talmidim. Um, and I actually stopped teaching a regular morning share for exactly that reason for a year, the first year that I started traveling as much as I do, which is roughly once a month for a few days, maybe a week. Sometimes a week means Motzi Shabbos till, you know, till Thursday or something like that. Also, sometimes it means a full week with a Shabbos. Sometimes it could be 10 days, but that's about once a month. Uh, I'm there, there about a quarter of the year, uh, which is a lot. Um, but, um, I wouldn't have been able to do it before, and I wouldn't have been able to do an erasure from the beginning. So the first year that I, I was traveling on that schedule, I didn't give a morning shear and erasure. Uh, that did not work out well for me. It didn't work out well for the yeshiva. It didn't work out well for the Talmidim. So then we went to a model that has been going on for the past few years of the fact that I have a very, very strong uh, a partner who's teaching this year as well, who's with us all the time. He's not a substitute teacher, and uh, there have been a whole bunch of people who have done that over the years, and they've uh, it's been a very, very rewarding and wonderful kind of, of team relationship, and it works out well for the guys it has its sacrifices but um i always tell them that although it clearly is for me and for them a degree of sacrifice and not ideal actually the work that i'm doing is very relevant i think the days that i'm there are more valuable because of the work that i do and the trips that i take first of all i spend a lot of time interacting with alumni and alumni are the same thing as the students just a few years down the road. So those experiences are, are very, very valuable and just work with the greater community. There's a beautiful synergy between the work that I do in Rashid and the work I do with NCSY. I'm better in NCSY because of the work that I do in Rashid and I'm much better in Rashid because of the work that I do with NCSY. So there's always a little bit of a give and a take and, and thank God it's work that it needs to be evaluated all the time about how well it works and, and how it works. But you gotta work hard to make it work. Like I said about the kids, you have to know what you're giving up and therefore how to compensate for uh, for all of that there was a year in which i remember with my kids because you forget about traveling to america the six weeks in ncsy kolal i'm not parent of the year you know by any stretch of the imagination i mean so there's one year i was sitting with my wife about it and we saw that our kids their kids were very young this particular time so there was a week where it's week had six days we had six kids who were living at home there was a 12-hour you know bonding post-summer recalibration Sunday was one kid, Monday was the next kid, Tuesday was the next kid, you know, we only did that once, we only needed to do it once, but you have to, you have to know at all time when you need to, you can't go business as usual and then take such a big bite out of your priorities and what you're doing and expect it all to work out. You've got to always be balancing and compensating in the places where you need to compensate. So on the topic of NCSY Kolal, this yeah. is, this is something I feel like, I don't know who knows the answer to this question, I think. I'm personally very curious, and, and and I'm sure there's hundreds of alumni from NCSY Cola that will listen to this, but I've seen you in the summer with NCSY Cola, and I have a tremendous amount of respect of how you're able to fully give yourself to a program that has so many moving parts. How in the world do you do it? That's the first question. And also, what are things about that job that nobody knows in terms of the lack of sleep that you get to what has to be done in order to run a program like NCSY Cola? I don't know. It's a fun question. Your second question. I don't know. I don't know what the, uh, you could push me on it a little bit and we could try to think of some things. Uh, if nobody knows them, it might be better that way, even if I came up with a few things, but let's see, let's see how much you, you push me on them. How, how does a person do it and has that program get built and how does any individual do it? So, I mean, I apologize for the fact that these answers are cliches and even one of them I said already, but first of all, you do it when you're smart enough to get extraordinary help. Uh, I am not in any way shape or form and never have been singularly responsible for anything. The size of the program, but even when the program was tiny, there are so many moving pieces and you need a lot of people that are really, really good at what they are doing. Uh, I often have the conversation with people who are deciding extremely talented young men who are in university or in uh, in Shana Aleph, Shana Bet, in Yeshiva, and the, some of them are very talented. They have a lot, a lot of other offers. So a conversation that I'll often have with them will go, they'll say, look, we know that NCSY Kolel is a perfect fit for us. We know it's the place we want to be for selfish reasons. It's the place where we'll probably have the greatest number of friends and the greatest growth opportunities. Uh, but what we feel is, is about being redundant. We feel like an NCSY Kolel, there are so many madrichim, and you have the world-class rabbeim, and we're not even talking about the Rashi Yeshiva. And then there are people like Rabbi Leibowitz and Rabbi Turetsky and Rabbi Israeli who are hovering around also on the program. 
I could be on that program and I can end up, or, or I can go to a TJJ program or I can go to a different camp or I can go to a different program where I can be the man. And it's not an ego thing necessarily, but my hashpa will be so much greater. This is, I, I'll have a tafket, I'll have a purpose. Who cares whether I'm on NCSY Kolel or not? Uh, let me go to a place where every day it's, it's Aina Dover Taloy I am I am so needed. Well, if I don't go on NCSY Kolel, on CSY Kolel would be fine. If I don't go on TJJ, maybe Maybe TJJ is going to fall apart. Maybe there's going to be nothing else that's there. So I, I, I hear the logic of that, but I couldn't disagree more for two reasons. And the second of the two reasons is the question that you asked about how, how we get it done and how the system works. One reason why I disagree is just because the logic of where you are most needed and where you will have the most hashpa is linked much more to where a person belongs than, than we sometimes think. Meaning there is something about being part of a force like NCSY Colel. I often describe it as rowing in the same direction as the currents that are there. You, you, you can't be, you're not going to be as effective as the Lone Ranger. You're not going to be as effective when you're the only one who's doing something. Sometimes their being part of a team is, is very helpful in that regard. But their being part of the team cuts it another way also, which is like I said, the answer to your question. There are very few, it sounds, that's the type of argument that sounds great in April. I'm telling you that in July and August on the program, there are very few people who feel like their role is insignificant. There is so much to be done, and we need so many people who are at the top of their game in order to be great. I can give you another sports analogy again, but you know it to be true. There, there's hero ball in basketball. Those teams never win anything whatsoever. And there is such a thing in basketball as redundant efforts. You know, KD joins the Warriors, and you think to yourself, wow, they're going to be unstoppable. We're adding the best, one of the best offenses of all time. We're adding KD. One of those shots have to come from somewhere so it's not always that you just add 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 and it's better but if you add smartly and you add in complementary ways and you develop and you put people in different areas what if there were 19 warriors teams like in those summers that we had 75 kaburas what if you gave everybody their area and their place in which they can be that level of superstar then it becomes not so redundant and it becomes incredibly valuable in that way you would think that people would not only make that argument in may but they would be july and august that we would spend most of our time with our staff with people who feel like uh, I, I don't really I'm not necessary here one 11 o'clock conversation with a teen one incredible Chabura with an apathetic disinterested disinterested 11th grader in which you were able to actually teach them something of meaning and awaken them to the beauty of Torah is enough to convince you that your efforts are not being wasted and it's not being redundant at all and we build a program in that way one of the smartest things we have ever done on NCSY Kolel was once again kind of invert that pyramid, similar to what I described before. There are programs that have the firepower that we do with the Rashi Yeshiva and with everything else that goes on that might make you think the Madrich's job is to deliver their guys to the wow moments and to the great Torah personalities and then get out of the way. And the NCSY Kolel mentality is exactly the opposite, which answers the question of how any of us are able to do what we do. We view our jobs to deliver deliver the guys to the madrichim and to their morning shiurim and to the, those times. And if they get inspiration from an interaction with a great public speaker or with one of the Rosh Yeshiva, it's meant to fuel their connection and their ability to sit with a chavrusa, with a chabura, or sit inside a shear. So when you have that type of inverted pyramid, first of all, it takes the pressure off the directors there. It totally changes what our job is. I'm not, I'm not pushing this giant boulder up a hill. I'm supporting the people who are all banding together. Okay, that's a very, very different job, and it does allow you a degree of, of release and, and the rest of it. We work hard in the summer, anybody who's invested in it, because that's the you, you have to care a tremendous amount, and you have to, you have to know your work very, very well, and, and Thank God we have a bunch of people who do. How, how many hours of sleep would you say you average per night? On not a lot. <laughs> not a lot. Um, yeah, not a lot. I mean, and, and, and in some of the years, it was uh, dangerously low and little. It's an intense six-week experience that requires an enormous amount, even when you're careful, as everybody should be, about preserving your own health and about boundaries in terms of what makes sense to do at 2 o'clock in the morning and not since 2 o'clock in the morning. Staff meetings should not be at 2 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and, and certainly interactions, discipline conversations with a teenager, heart-to-heart -heart about struggles 
none of those things make sense at two o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. But if you do those things all day, then at two o'clock in the morning, you could speak to parents for whom it's 7 p.m. and you could take care of catching up on emails and the rest of it. So, so even when you, you keep boundaries, there, there is an enormous amount of work that needs to be done. Um, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, you got to be ready to do hard work. In anything you want to be successful, you got to be ready to do hard work, though. That's the form the hard work takes. It's, it's six weeks where, where you got to be all in. It's that kind of program. All summer programs are those kinds of programs. That's not unique to, to what we're doing at all. Do you have any crazy uh, stories, I guess you could say, throughout your time of NCS by Call All of just either it's something that's crazy unexpected that happened out of nowhere or something related to that? I don't know. You want happy ones, funny ones? We have a million of them. It's, it's 30 years. There are a lot of things. We've run the program through wars, of course. We've run the programs through all sorts of surprises and unexpected twists and turns. Uh, we've had, you know, we, we've had at least two occasions where we had students directly in the line of fire of bus bombings in Yerushalayim. Um, that's a big part of my own personal kind of Aliyah story. Um, so that might be a good one to, you know, to talk about a little bit. Uh, we ran the program through wars. We ran the program um, through all sorts of, um, of crises and, and different things that were, that were going on. Um, Again, given the time that we're in, I guess I'll keep it on a little bit on the heavy side, but these are these are wild things. We spent a lot of time talking about, which most programs never had the opportunity to do in the summer of disengagement. And of course, over the past four months, we've had a lot of that with what's going on in Gaza right now. Uh, so one of our rebellion was my dear friend by Ari Katz, who coincidentally now is living in Stay Road and now has his second kind of massive conflict that he's literally right in the middle of. Rabbi Ari Katz was serving as a Rebbe that summer. He had told me in June that he may miss a bunch of days because they were in the process of evacuating him from his home in, in Gush Katif. Um, and he he uh, he communicated with the students on a regular basis, gave them play by play of what happened. The Gush Katif, the expulsion took place right after Tisha B'Av of that year. And uh, he had not been in Shear for a few days because as it was getting closer, there was a tremendous amount of activity and to Hillam rallies and political activism and the rest of it that was going on. Uh, and uh, he called me up to tell me right before we dive in Marav at 10 p.m. on the day of evacuation, he called me up to tell me that, uh, that the army was at his door and that the buses were there and they were actually, you know, tearfully leaving their homes, being evacuated from the community. And I asked him if he would, if he would be okay if I put him on hold for a minute until we finished davening Marav. And in lieu of the announcements that night, I put my cell phone up against the microphone in the bima of the OJ base medrash. And he gave, he gave play by play of, of his own and his family's expulsion from Gush Katif. Everybody was sitting there in the base medrash, like riveted, you know, as he was saying, we're getting on the bus right now, we're, we're driving past the gates, you know, through my cell phone on the microphone, you know, kind of on the fly doing those types of things. That, that's what happens when you have like a real heartful connection to, to what's happening and, and to what's going on. And you appreciate that that's, uh, you know, that's what it is. The story, I mean, again, there, there, were, there were two times. It was, it was once the last Thursday of the program, which used to be a big day of everybody going to Yerushalayim. And that was the day of the Sparrows bombing, bombing unfortunately. Um, people give me, give me credit for this, but it's actually not, I don't tell the story in order of my own credit. It's what any sensible and responsible person would do. Um, there was a, I got a call, all the, all the guys were going out with their chaburas that afternoon, the day of the Sparrows bombing. And we had a perimeter, which is largely arbitrary, by the way, because a bombing could be anywhere. But you have these rules, and there are a bunch of reasons why you have these rules about where you can go and where you can't go, and whether you can go on your own or whether you can go with a madrich. What's a madrich going to do if there's a bomb? Is he going to save you? So the answer to that question is, of course not. But the role of being only with a madrich is that hopefully the madrich will have a little bit more common sense about where you can go and where you can't go. And also, in the event, God forbid, that something happens, there, when, when, there's, when there's a bombing or something like that or a missile attack, there are many people who get injured just because they don't know what to do when there's an attack and they fall down when they're running or you know anything else like that. A madrich can account for everyone in the event that he's not going to be able to protect you if anything happened, but he's going to be able to account for you if nothing happened and get you to safety if nothing happened. So we had all these rules like that, and those rules were in place, and we had nobody anywhere near Sabaros. And about uh, 45 minutes before the Sabaros bomb went off, a madrich called me up in a panic. He was not a madrich who had an enormous amount of patience. He said, so-and-so, my chabur is making me crazy. He is saying these rules are stupid, and he's saying he's going anyway, and he wants to go get pizza in the middle of town. Pizza in the middle of town meant Sparrows. Oh. And, and he, he said, I can't deal with him anymore. You talk to him. So I took the phone. I, I had the phone the whole time. He handed the phone to this fellow, and the fellow made his case, and I said, I hear what you're saying, but you know what? This is our last Thursday, and we didn't bend and break until now. We're not going to bend and break now. Uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't, you got to stay with your madrich and, and don't, no, you can't get pizza in the middle of town. 
And then, uh, okay, a lot of people were not so lucky, and the day was an enormous tragedy. Certainly not a day for us to make a suit of or anything else like that. But but the guy said, oh, you saved my life. I'm like, I didn't really save your life, meaning meaning the the system and the, and the rules, the kind of, you know, we're, we're doing what we're doing, and we're doing what we're doing for a reason, and we're not making decisions kind of, you know, haphazardly or anything else like that. And you and you have, uh, you know, you have Siata Dishmaya, that, uh, that, that that's it. And, and that's all you can do. I, I think there's a very deep, almost philosophical point about that. All we can do is what we can do, and and it's why you know I, I have there, there have been there have been people who have um, you know that that's all we could be responsible for, not necessarily outcomes. And and when we ran the program, when there were missiles flying overhead in the last Gaza war, that was also an enormous comfort. Meaning I I'm, I wasn't guaranteeing anybody any outcomes. I was guaranteeing them that we were going to do what we felt to be most responsible. That's a huge clall in life, especially when we feel feel houseless. You've got something to do. That's something to do is not guarantee success or safety. That's just not the way the world works. But you have your your hishtadlis and your responsibility and the things that that you have to do. And and the, the, all three of these stories are in the same kind of vein. But um, but the I, I count and I've I've recounted this many many times. But I count. Um, at least four, if not five different times as my quote unquote Aliyah date. Um, my family and I, um, first of all, um, we, we came officially 21 years ago. We came on a trial, even though we kind of suspected it was going to be more than a trial, but we certainly didn't make Aliyah when we came to Israel. Coming to Israel, as I'll get back to in a minute, was complicated because coming to Israel meant that we we got on the plane in July with NCSY Colo that we always did. So it was kind of weird to call that. The real Aliyah date, and this is one I'll get back to in a minute, was the day we didn't get on the plane going home. That's what I consider to be. Uh, I personally didn't even make Aliyah a year later for a variety of reasons. Uh, I made Aliyah 15 years later. So I have on my two dots of hood, a different Aliyah date. And again, you have all of these, all these different possibilities. Like I said, that's at least four right there of the Aliyah date. The day in July that we flew, the day in August that we didn't fly back, the day in which my family made Aliyah a year later, the day in which that, that was the same day as they had their Nefesh Benefesh flight, which was from Israel to Israel, but you know, essentially, and the day in which 15 years later when I made Aliyah. The one that I really considered to be my Aliyah is that day in August when we didn't get on the plane. I have a very dear friend, Rabbi Zevi Reinitz, he lives in remote right now, uh, at Zevi Reinitz, who grew up in Detroit, so his, his family made Aliyah at one point. And, uh, and he used to very emotionally, because he grew up an American kid with all his friends in Detroit and all his Madrich friends are going to YU, he never got on that plane at the end of August. So it was always a very, very painful night for him. And I, all the times where I said goodbye to him, I used to always say to Zevi, you know, before, before when we said goodbye, and he was so unbelievably sad and depressed. I said, Zevi, you're in the right place. We're all in the wrong place. I can't wait for the day in which not you join us, but where I and everybody else joins you. And, uh, and that night was very special to be with Zevi and Rabbi Leibowitz and those people as the plane went off. Unfortunately, that night was uh, filled with tragedy as well. The number two bus bombing was that night. And we, once again, like in Sparrows, directly interacted with it. The number two bus, which is the famous number two bus bombing, as famous as the Sparrows bombing, the number two bus runs from the Kotel to the other places in Yerushalayim. And when they trace the steps of the suicide bomber, they figured that he got on at the Kotel. They also put the time when he got on the Kotel. The time he got on the Kotel was the time in which, at the time, was probably about 150 NCSY Kolo boys were making their way to security to go to Marif. It means we walked past the bus bomber, uh, which is a crazy only in Israel type of thing. Not only that, but when we dive into our last Marif at the Kotel, this is one of the main reasons why we no longer end with Marif because of things like this might happen. We now dive into the last Mincha and then have a more you know relaxed view because of the trauma of this night. When we were davening Marif, Yishlam is a very small town, we were davening Marif that night at the Kotel, uh, we heard during our silent Shimon Esrei, when it was relatively quiet on the Kotel Plaza, we heard the bomb go off. Uh, you could hear it in Yerushalayim, and you know whether it's fireworks or a backfiring based on the sirens that come immediately after. Fireworks and cars backfiring don't have huge sirens. This was the boom, and then and then the sirens, and we knew in the middle of our silent Shimon Esrei. So we drove to the airport on the buses, got everybody together quickly and right away, drove to the airport, 
uh, with the backdrop of all the news reporting, unfortunately, of all the people who died and, and the rest of it. And that was the night that I stayed with Zevi and stayed with Rabbi Leibowitz. After we said goodbye to Zevi in the airport and Rabbi Leibowitz and I drove home to Ramat Beit Shemesh, it was going to be the first night sleeping in my home, probably the second night, something like that over the course of the summer. But this was really making Ali on going home, not getting on a plane at the end of the summer, going to Ramat Beit Shemesh. So Rabbi Leibowitz and I were both very distraught. There was not a word spoken between us. But when we got on Highway 1 to the exit to Beit Shemesh on Route 38, he just turned to me as we were listening to these terrible, terrible news reports. He said, welcome, welcome to Israel. And I turned to him and I said, I actually feel welcome. Like this, this is why we're here. This is, this is, this is part of the deal. I, I, as terrible as this is, it would be far worse to get on a plane tonight and to be leaving this, to go to a place where you don't belong without knowing the future that, that things in America are not that great either. So that was, uh, uh, these, these are all, uh, again, I, I, in, in, in light of what's going on right now, you have me back at different time when the Jewish people are in a different situation. I'll tell you some of the more funny, humorous, and uh, and enjoyable stories. I'll tell you one of those also. Okay. It's a good one. <laughs> now, just because you'll appreciate, I, I'm tempted to even to give the names, but we had, we had two high level madrichem, a head madrich and a guy who was the head of sports. Both very, uh, one of them at least is is very well. They're both pretty well known in their respective communities nowadays. They were both big ball players, and they were very good friends, and they were enormous uh, pranksters uh, to one another. And there was one summer in which they each had a an intro. I might have been the three on three tournament or an intramural team. I don't remember which one it was. And they were both extremely successful on it. Now remember, keep in mind they were very good friends, high ranking uh, Madrichim staff members. And they were also incredible pranksters to one another. So one of them pulled off one of the all-time great pranks on the other. One of them had a a wedding, I think, in America that he he left like in the middle of the wedding so that he could not miss his league playoff game and make it back, you know, for the championship or anything else like that. And the whole time he's like, I know, like, I know the show's gotta go on and everything, but I'm gonna make it back, do the schedule, do the thing, you know, anything else like that. I gotta be there, I gotta be there. We're like, listen, we're gonna do our best. We don't know if we're gonna be able to do it. We knew we were gonna be able to do it. it wasn't even that big a deal at all but we're like we're gonna try if the flight's delayed we don't we're gonna be able to do it and he's like you gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta and this guy arranged an entire fake game with his biggest rival as a substitute there and as his cab pulled up he watched as his team totally fake watched as his team won the championship without him and he got there he was so angry and so he's like you played the game without me and they won without me and it's like and the guy my biggest rival was the guy on the team they were like they, it was so beautiful it was awesome they were like carrying him off his biggest rival on the shoulders they orchestrated a game winning shot just when he got there to go there like they won the championship on it and it was uh, it was an epic prank of uh, great proportions it's good uh, it's good to be like he was uh, he was not happy uh, but it was good uh, good job anyway we got a lot of good stories over the years so i i i can't help but notice from this conversation and, and then also hearing your other shiurim and speeches you're a big fan of taking the sports world and yeah. i guess bringing that into to chinuch. so talk a little bit about how that impacts the way you you mechanic kids today and in, in your interaction with the kids. Well, I'll tell you what it isn't first and foremost, and, and, and people ask me this question all the time. It's not fake, as you can tell from the way I talk about it. It's not like, listen, I think sports is stupid, but what am I going to do? You know, I got to find some way to get into these guys. There, there's always a way to get into people. Care about them, care about, you know, life, and you will find the commonalities. You don't have to pretend or fake, and you don't need that to be an excuse for why you follow or are aware of things, things in sports. We all have a responsibility in terms of how we spend our time. We have a responsibility in how we spend our time in technology. There's no excuse, not all the chinuch in the world could justify or does justify wasting time or or prioritizing. Sports doesn't matter at the end of the day. Uh, it only matters in as much as it helps us be the people that we need to be. It doesn't have inherent or independent value for anybody or for anything. So the answer to your question is never based on uh, the fact that, uh, you know, that you, you have to, uh, you know, have to sacrifice in order to connect with your students. It's not going to work like that. They'll see right through it most of the time. Uh, you become a type of, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing, and it's, it's not an honest way to interact with your students ever. I, I think it emerges from two things that are definitely connected and they overlap with each other. First of all, I fundamentally do believe that there are certain elements of sports, both spectator and participatory, that are elements of bringing out certain elements of greatness and certain lessons that are just easily and obviously learned from it. I can give lots of examples. I do give shiurim and have opportunities to speak about this. It's one of the reasons why I set the bar so high and I have such 
intense criticism of the way in which both in spectator and participatory sports, why we miss these easy opportunities. It's not that we're corrupting something neutral. We're corrupting something that would be so incredibly positive. And therefore, things like the Yeshiva League, which could be so much more of a Kiddush Hashem, if every ref, most of whom are not Jewish, who ref the Yeshiva League game said, what was that? That was incredible basketball but yet something else and more and different, that would be one of the greatest Kiddush Hashems in the world and would also make sense. Outstanding B'nai Torah can play basketball on a high level and they could play it differently. It doesn't mean they run different sets, although it might mean that also sometimes. It doesn't mean that they have a better shooting percentage. It means that they have a great shooting percentage and they also just have a understanding of sportsmanship and the underlying values of sports that exist there. That, that's like I said, that's what, that's what emerges from that. I think in two areas in particular, there are, there are these inherent values that emerge from sports. One of them would be this, this very unforgiving kind of cause and effect, schar um type of meritocracy, which is lacking from the rest of our world. Sports is a very, very demanding discipline. And you are what you are, and you get what you get. And you work hard, and you perform on a high level, and you are a champion, and if you don't, you lose. And that's a very, in a confusing world, I think that's a very powerful and beautiful message. I don't know how many people would develop a work ethic, a practice ethic, a hard work, a sweat and tears ethic without the goal of sports being at the end of it. It's very, very valuable in that way. You could have those uplifting experiences of what that means in order to, to do that. Bill Bradley, uh, who was a United States Senator, Princeton graduate, and a, and a really, really deep thinker and a very moral man, was also a member of the Princeton in a team that won, won an NCAA championship or a very, very good Princeton team and obviously won a championship with the New York Knicks. Uh, quite an interesting fellow. So he, he wrote a book. It's a relatively short book, but very, very powerful. It's called Values of the Game, in which he identified the fact, Phil Jackson speaks about this a lot, that the game itself possesses certain certain values and certain things there. Bill Simmons, who I'm a big fan of, he has a column in which he writes about the fact that he, he wouldn't know what bonding is if he didn't experience in his own experience as a gym rat, you know, the little head nod or fist bump when you make a perfect pass to a teammate. He's like, there's nothing in the world that's as real as that. The cohesion and that type of interaction, you don't have to fake it, you don't have to yell it, you don't have to do anything. Just that little bit, that little, you know, pointing your finger just that you did it. You you cut when I was passing. We ready the, telepathy. How do I know telepathy exists? How do I know that there's a spiritual connection between people? You might learn that on a basketball court when you function in the right way and you're kind of interacting in that way. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful thing to watch. I I, I have a uh, favorite high school team of all time. When I was teaching an MTA, there was an MTA team that won the championship. I could list most of the guys who were on uh, that team over then. It was Morty Faber, pre Yussi Faber was uh, was a member of that team. One of the Nice brothers was on that team. There was a Bloom on that team, a Shane on that team. They were a really wonderful team. Uh, the thing that I loved most about that team was that I didn't even know as big a sportsman as one was what help defense was. They played defense instinctively like there were five people who were defending. They didn't play zone. They played man. They had instinctive and highly tuned like interact um, rotations on defense that were just based on the fact that we are not five individual defenders. We are five people who are defending five people and we will seamlessly recover and know that they practice that all the time and then they did it all the time. It was the most amazing thing to watch in the world. I've never seen a ballet choreography. I don't watch a lot of ballet, but <laughs> I've never seen a ballet choreography or anything else that was as as beautiful and as graceful as watching these five guys play play defense together. But that, that's like, that, that's this week's parsha. That's Vayichan Shem Neged Ar Kishachad Belevechad. We're recording this on the week of Parsha's Yisro. That's a degree of actual kind of unison and connection. And look at that. You, you learn it from the, the world of sports. I attended, the best sporting event that I attended live in my life was the Yankees clinching game in 1996. Uh, Jeter's uh, almost rookie year. Uh, was, the core four was very young then. 96. The last time they had won a World Series was 78. In 1978, I was five years old. I was a Yankee fan, but I barely remembered it. So most of my real diehard Yankee fandom was in misery. Uh, they were they were not even as good as the Mets in a lot of those years. The Strawberry, good in Mets. And the Mets won in 86. The Yankees won nothing when I was following them. 96, I was already an adult. I was already married, but uh, but somebody was kind enough to get me tickets 
to the clinching game, was on a Motsi Shabbos and went to that game. And I remember commenting at that game, thinking to myself, I've learned this Rashi, again, this week's Parsha for when we're recording this, by Yichin Shem Yisrael Negadahar, I've learned this Rashi a hundred times. I never understood it until I stood with 56,000 people who were one entity watching that game and getting excited, you know, about what was going on. Um, it was uh, Mariana Rivera, who was at the time the setup man, you know, came in from the bullpen, no TV was on. It's during the commercial. You know, he's coming in to pitch the seventh and eighth innings. Uh, and the crowd's reaction to Mariana Rivera. I remember, it took my, I'm like, wow, Lahavda, Vayichan Shem Yisrael, you know, Kishachad Belevachad. There might be 56,000 people here. They're all thinking, doing, and focused on the exact same thing and having the same emotional reaction to what's going on. That's cool. That's cool when you can do those things instead of saying, this is stupid or this is just a tool, you know, to anything else that's, uh, that, that's going on. And the reason why I speak about sports is not to get credibility with my students that oh look he knows something about sports i know more about sports than any of them it's a it's been a long time there have been very few of them that have been able to beat me in obscure trivia or anything else like that i don't need more credibility that i know something about sports it doesn't make me cool in their eyes i can't do anything about that you know all the sports in the world aren't going to make a grandfather relevant to them i don't speak their lingo as much anymore but what i do it is is they show that i can care about something and caring and passion those translate no matter what it's for me it's sports but in other words it's always good to speak about and to express and to use examples of you know the things that you care about and that you're passionate about i once spoke to a group of more elderly women here in ramat Pechemesh, and my wife was horrified because i began with an elaborate sports example and mushal <laughs> they, they, they had never heard of the sport that i was speaking about which was baseball by the way but not one of them could mention like what baseball they were unfamiliar with what baseball was let alone i promise you it was an obscure sports mushal i could share it with you later if you would like that was my opening bit my wife's like didn't know what you're talking about i'm like yeah but they did know that i cared they I was telling them that was my ultimate proof that it has nothing to do with gaining credibility. It's just a way of generating energy and passion in the room. So on the topic of just caring and, and I kind of want to channel this and, and, and I always like to phrase one question to, to end off this podcast and I'll phrase it to you in, in from all the years of having so much involvement with so many different kids from the NCSY world to the ratio world and so on and so forth. If you had one message that was like, Put this little message in a bottle and take it with you wherever you go for the rest of your life about anything. What would that be? I'm speaking to one of my students uh, primarily or yeah. a group of, of these students. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, however you want to phrase it. It's hard to condense so many things that I'm passionate about into a phrase or two. I imagine... It would be something to the effect of there is a version of yourself and your life that you have not yet discovered and that will be the most incredible, rewarding, and enriching thing that you ever meet in your entire life, that you ever encounter. There is a version of yourself and of your life that you have not yet revealed that will be the most rewarding and enriching thing that you ever encounter in your life. I, I think that would be... Uh, most of it. And that relates directly not to a chicken soup from the soul, you know, kumbaya everything. It's specifically, I think, through our truest identity and our connection to Torah and Mesorah, ashrenu matov chelkenu, and, and chelkenu dafka. I was asked a question similar to yours uh, when I started teaching an MTA uh, a great number of years ago. Um, uh, that was one of my first formal teaching jobs. And uh, I was interviewed by Avram Simcha Adler, who is a dear friend now. I just saw him in Bergenfield a little while ago. He was a journalist for the Academy News when he was in the 11th or 12th grade. And I was one of the five new teachers. They asked the same teachers to all of them. And he asked me a question similar to yours, what are you trying to accomplish uh, in, your, in your teaching? And I had never thought about that question. I hadn't been teaching for more than five minutes. Uh, but I said to him, I guess I'm trying to convince every student in MTA, at the time I was teaching the weakest students in MTA, that they have a chilek in Torah. That they, this, this Torah, this world is speaking to them and sharing with them. That's the flip side of the same answer that I just gave you. I mean, you can't have one without the other. What I really wanted to tell, what I was really trying to accomplish in those very, very challenging classrooms in MTA was to expose people who had been beaten down and convinced of their lack of worth, that there is a version of themselves in their lives that is the most incredible, joyous, uplifting thing that they will ever encounter. And the way that you do that is by recognizing that you have a chilek in this Torah. That you have a chilek in this world, that you have your Dalet Amos and Eretz Yisrael, that you have your plot of land and that you have your place in which you can truly be incredible, where you can truly be happy, where you can truly be great. 
Amazing. So I, I, as I started with a little bit of Hakar Sotov, I'm just going to end it again. Um, I know how busy you are. And I know how busy your schedule is. And the fact that we were able to sit and have this conversation. Um, I had so many topics on this piece of paper right here. And God willing, we'll do another one of these because okay. there's a lot more to talk about. Sometime. Yep. But um, just really thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time. Thank and, you for uh, the opportunity. It's always great to sit uh, with good people and talk about important things. Awesome. That is a wrap of episode three with her benefits. I really enjoyed that conversation right there. And I hope you guys took a lot from what we discussed over the past hour. There's so many more topics I have on this sheet of paper that to be honest with you, I didn't get through more than 15% of what's here. So that means we have to have her benefits back again, God willing. So thank you guys so much for watching this episode of the BM podcast. Feel free to give us a like if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to share this with a friend on WhatsApp, Spotify, Apple podcasts, whatever it may be. And we look forward to seeing you guys in the next episode.